Hey everybody. Good afternoon. Another beautiful day here in Ohio. Got my coffee. Hope you guys have yours. Take a moment just to have a quick sip here. That is good. Welcome to the stream today. You might have noticed there was a little poll up there. Good morning, Bob. Good to see you. A burger man. I like it. I'm happy to see it. Yeah, I started off with a hot dogs or hamburgers poll, and I decided, hey, you know, maybe I should keep it more more on topic. And looking at the poll, so I have a poll here for my fellow leather workers. Uh, which do you prefer to do, edge paint or burnishing? And I expected uh, burnishing to win out on that one, just because it's a little simpler and it's the more well known of the two. But in a in a upset, uh, edge paint has taken it with uh, six people voting for edge paint and four for burnishing. I'm going to leave that poll going through the stream, and we'll see where it ends up towards the end there. If anybody else wants to sign off on their opinion there. But if it came down to me, which do I prefer to do? I suppose I should have clarified it. Which do I prefer to do, or which do I like the look of better? And I actually, I enjoy burnishing. Burnishing is a lot of fun, uh, and it's relatively quick to do. But as far as which one I actually like the look of better, I think it would have to be edge paint. Now, there's nothing like a, a nicely clean, crisp, painted edge there, so. Hello, Steve, good to see you. A burger dog. Now, that is something I would be... Well, no, I don't know. You know, now that I think about it, the more I the more I unpack that one, the less I, the less interested in that I am, so. I think I, I think it's got to be one or the other. I think trying to make some kind of unholy amalgamation of the two is, is not, not, not what God intended. <laughs> But to each their own. I certainly won't stop you from enjoying a burger dog. If you add ketchup to a hot dog, are you edge painting? Arguably, that could be. You know, if you're used to using the uh, the little needle needle tip bottles for edge painting, then yes, arguably, I could say yes, you are edge painting. But no, I'm a no ketchup man. No ketchup at all. And they can't do ketchup. So when we left off last week, I had uh, the last week's stream covered the creation of these panels here, the uh, the two sets of card slots, and I'm looking at it now, I think I'm going to adjust my camera real quick, so hold tight. There we go. A little, a little too dark there. So as I was saying, last week we put these card slots together, uh, and yesterday I took the liberty of going ahead and attaching them to the back there and stitching the top, just because it's not particularly exciting and it pretty much looks exactly like you would expect there are two pieces of leather one on the inside one on the outside glued on the 90 skived at the edges there and then we stitch and paint across the top there so nothing really special about doing that uh, and nothing you're not going to see in a more interesting format with what we're going to do today so basically what we have to do next we have to make the outer panel for this what we're going to do that's going to be done with uh, glazed cognac alligator so we need to make a panel that is the same size as this but has a long enough extra width on the outside to fold around the curve because that's one of the things that people i think if you haven't designed a bifold before or if you haven't done many things that fold it's kind of a an esoteric concept to wrap your head around it doesn't uh, easily come to mind thinking that you have to have two different lengths of pieces for it to be able to fold and many people in the show and critique uh, uh, board there often show that, uh, you know, why does it wrinkle? Why does it wrinkle when I fold? Why won't it fold? Because you've made it to the same length on both the inside and the outside. So on my outer pieces here, I'll actually show you. I have my two templates here. Here's my outer panel. Here to my inner panel. And you can see we have about an extra three-eighths of an inch on the outside versus the inside there. And that's the fold allowance. That is what gives the extra length necessary to be able to wrap around and fit bills inside of it. Now, it's important to note that when you're designing one of these, you cannot, if you're doing this for the purpose of holding bills, you cannot do it purely for length to wrap around this. In other words, you cannot have it just exactly the amount of extra length needed to fold around this. You need a little bit more. Uh, and that is because when you put bills in there, even a single bill, uh, it will require extra length to wrap around and also fit the bill inside of it. 
So what you'll find is if you have it measured you know, perfectly, it is perfectly the right length just to do a fold empty, uh, it may not fold when there are bills in there. And even something as thin as a piece of paper as, as a dollar bill can be enough to fight that and either unwantedly stretch the outside or wrinkle the inside or just wrinkle the bill up, which is not a desire. None of those are desirable. So something to keep in mind if you're looking to make one of these. Add more length than you think you need, both to fit the fold and also to fit the bills inside of it. So kind of a kind of an unusual thing there to think of. Like I said, I've got this all ready to go, and I've edge painted the top here. I'm going to go with a get some light on there. A little difficult to tell, but we've got brown edge painting on this. So we're going to do a green interior with brown thread and brown paint on the outside there. I have two coats of paint on this. This being a thin edge, it doesn't take much more than that. The one other thing I want to talk about real quick that I decided to wait to do on camera, I've got my, my two coats on here. The first coat I've done, I've heat spread it with uh, my filatus just to kind of melt it into the edge and give a solid sandable layer to, to bond a fresh put a paint to, and a thicker layer on top there for it to give more of a dome shape to it. And I've gone over ahead after it was well and dry and hit it with the filatus again just to smooth out any troughs or little you know, depressions and things like that. I could do that with a block sander, but more and more I find myself doing it with the filatus instead. Uh, and I'm still, I haven't quite come to a conclusion on that yet. That's how I'm doing it right now. When I have something more concrete as to which one is better, block sanding or smoothing with the, uh, the heat, I'll, I'll let you know. But what I want to do here real quick, I'm going to take this. So it's a nice, relatively smooth edge. What I want to do, oh, thank you, Mike. Hey, I was I was looking for you, Michael. It's good to see you. I, I reached out to you the other day, but didn't hear back from him. And I was thinking, oh, man, does he hate me now? I hope so. <laughs> it's good to see you. But what I'm going to do here, after I do this, before I'm going to finish it, I, I do what's called a dry buff. And uh, by that I mean I'm doing it with no alcohol and with no wax. I'm just taking a piece of canvas and going over the edge dry and applying some vigorous friction pressure to it. So I'm going to do that here. I have my burnishing canvas. This is the one I usually use you know, for regular you know, water or token oil burnishing. But no wax or anything else in it, just a dry canvas. I'm just going to take it over this. And I'm being quite vigorous with it. I'm actually, what I'm doing... It's a little difficult to tell, but I'm actually taking my fingers and pinching this canvas around the top of this edge because I really want it to grip it. I really want to get good friction against the edges on this, and particularly the edges, because what you'll find if you're doing a lot of heat spreading, uh, you may find that when you come up to the edge there, you get a little bit of a lip built up. And I find that dry brushing it or dry burnishing it achieves two things. Any minor little dirt nibs or things like that that may have been left over usually will be taken out without any aggressive abrasion, you know, without sanding. Usually the dry buff will take care of that. That little bit of friction and that little bit of heat that it builds up is enough to smooth that out. Any little brush strokes or things like that you have also oftentimes will come out. And as I mentioned before, that little bit of lip that you sometimes get at the edge there, usually the dry buff is enough to take care of that. Now, I'm doing this on Uniters, but I've done it with Feniche or Fenis before, and it gets roughly the same effect there. So, before you get too, too much into sanding, if you think you're getting near towards your final coat, try buffing it just with a dry cloth, and you'll get in, get in there aggressively with friction. And then afterwards, the way to tell if it's worked or not, if you've had any effect, is run your fingers over it. Feel it. Because it... Again, coming back to doing body work and, you know, automotive painting and things like that, the way you tell for surface defects is with your fingers. Um, on something that's very glossy, you can get down and, and you'll look at it and sometimes see it, but you'll never be able to see as much as you can feel with your hands. So run your hands over it and feel the difference, and you'll notice that if you've done it right, you'll have a smoother surface. Uh, sometimes it's smooth enough just to send it as is, you know, hit it with a little bit of wax and call it a day, and that you've taken off any little, you know, edges or, or small surface defects. Usually they come out with just a dry buff. So try that if you haven't done it before. See what you think of it. Uh, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of that method. I think it works very well for very little extra effort. I think the results are well worth it. Take a, take a moment to sip my coffee and read chat here. Morning, John. Hello, Nick. Nick Kindle says, I just had to make a wallet that held upwards of 50 bills. 
and I had about a half inch difference between the two sides, but it still wasn't enough, and it held 35 before ringing. 50 bills is a tremendous amount of bills. It reminds me of uh, back when painting cars, I would get certain uh, certain characters who would come in and pay for uh, you know, $2,000 paint jobs with 5 and 10s. And then my dad would always ask them if they had a paper route. They would laugh. So you get uh, you get folks carrying that many bills around. Oftentimes I'd find them coming in with uh, you know either held in a rubber band like inside a sock or just in a pocket, and I was always amazed that uh, <laughs> you have to have a lot of trust that you're not going to that your pockets are very deep to be able to hold that kind of money. Because if you lost that, that's a bad day. That's no small sum of money to be to be carrying around so casually. But people do it. People do it. At least they were getting a wallet made for theirs. So I, I would um I would certainly be interested in, in seeing that, Nick. If you have any pictures of it. <laughs> Good golly. So let's get on with the actual doing the thing, I suppose. We've done done the little thing I wanted to do there. We've done a little bit of surface prep. And, and again, me just looking at it, I'm going to turn it a little bit so you can see the light reflection there. I probably should have shown it beforehand, but you can see just right there how nice of a reflection we're getting from an otherwise unfinished edge. You know, this is basically just straight heat spread. No sanding, no high grit, nothing like that. Just a just a polish, just a buff with dry cloth. No wax, nothing like that. And that's that's a pretty that's a pretty nice finish. Where's the new haircut? You're looking at it. See, basically, it's the same haircut as before. It's not exactly new, but I get I get the part cut in. There you go. I just had it cut last week, so I like to have it down short on the sides and high on the top there. That part, I think, just and you know, with my my little bit of gray coming in in the front, I think it's it's rather fetching. My wife certainly likes it, so <laughs> it's my first coffee for the day. So, so bear with me as I as I work on that. Morning, John. Morning, other John. Good to see you. <laughs> so, this is what we're going to use for the back. Like I said, this is glaze cognac alligator from Amtan. Wonderful, wonderful color. And this one here, I believe, was something of a mist dye. Normally, the cognac is very red. This one here is actually closer to peanut, which is what uh, Bob was looking for initially. So I thought this would be a good fit. And actually, I, I had forgotten I had this. I did not remember that I even had this hide in my uh, inventory until he asked, you know, if I'd take a look and I... I went through and I, I came across this and I thought it was a, a perfect fit for this, especially with the green. I think these are just a just a no-brainer color combination. So we're gonna do we're gonna pick our hide section here that we want to use for the back. Now obviously we're gonna use a piece of belly from this, but which part of the belly are we going to use? There's quite a lot here. I have always been a fan of doing the horizontal cuts and by horizontal I mean going cross transversely through the belly rather than the way you know Hermes or Louis Vuitton will do it with a with a vertical cut there. Uh, I like the transition of large scale pattern in the middle and you get that very clear center point which I, I like and it starts with the big scales in the center and it goes out to the smaller flank scales. I find that very fetching. I, I, I like that. So I generally do a, a horizontal uh, cut there as well and from a material use standpoint, it's much more forgiving there as well, because rather than, you know, obviously coming through here, well, there's the whole hide shot, but uh, with this here, you know, God forbid if something goes wrong, we have the whole rest of the hide there. Nick, you should be able to post a link. Try it and see. I haven't had anybody posting. Only I've ever posted the links in there, so see if you can do it. Let me know if you can't. Not sure how to open it up to links in the first place anyway, but um, figure it out. Let me know. Let me know if you're able to do that or not. In any case, I've got my template here, and here's another advantage of doing it with a clear acrylic template. But it can also be done if you look back on my stream with the green alligator hide. It can be done with a paper template as well, using the negative space template to do that. Now I like using the clear ones because you get to see obviously the outline of your pattern, but also very clearly the exact appearance of the scales you're going to use. So that's obviously very helpful. I think I still have the negative template. Yeah, I do. In other words, if you didn't have your pattern done up in acrylic, 
you could still do it with paper as well by using the negative space template, doing it exactly the same. Basically just an inverse there. Uh, Mike, I never do uh, center center lines on, on there. Just because I, I seem to have a pretty good eyeball for marking the center lines. I, I can look at that and just tell. Knowing that... Um, Knowing that this is basically the same on either side, I usually go by the, the flank pattern. So I know that if I have an equal amount of flank on either side, and I do, I've got two fingers on each side, that's centered, and I don't really need to do much else. Because what you'll find sometimes, this line can be deceptive. Uh, although it looks pretty darn straight, it isn't always. On this one it is, but I have definitely had alligator eyes, or especially if you're up near here, it definitely wavers a little bit, and it has a bit of a zigzag. So just because you have the center line marked, not necessarily mean the alligator is going to respect it. <laughs> so we're going to do this. We're going to go ahead and mark out some, some lines here. And why have I chosen a line where I'm at? I haven't actually done that yet, but we're going to get a look at it. Down on top of it. And what I'm looking for with alligator, what you want to avoid, generally, but whenever practicable, what you want to avoid you want to avoid having an edge on one of these scale transitions here, just because it's much, much softer than everywhere else around it. And you try to want to avoid having a stitch fall in there as well, because you'll have a great difficulty trying to get a clean stitch in there versus something like the center of this big plate here, which is very dense and very stiff and easy to get a good cut and a good stitch through. So what I'm looking for here, I'm trying to find a place on the hide where my template kind of straddles in between there, where I know I have a good, I, I'm ending my edges on nice, solid center lines on these large scales here. I like the look of that. I think that might be it. I'm going to drop it down one and see if I like that better. No, I actually like it better like that. I think that's the way to go. I think that's, hold on. Hello. We might as well get this out of the way. You're so bright, you're washing out the camera. Am I gonna have to? Am I gonna have to turn down the camera exposure just to show you? So bright. You gonna say hello? You gonna say hello to everybody? No, you're not. Are you gonna try to be a better cat? Are you gonna try to be a better cat? Thank you. All right. Anyway, there's a couple of different ways you can mark this out. I have seen people do it with uh, tape and things like that. I don't trust that as much because I have in, in rare times, but enough. Hello again. I should have shut the door. But in rare times, I have had tape lift grain on these because, again, this glazed finish is not something that is applied or sprayed on top there, but it is a, it is a burnished finish. So you can, if you have the right kind of adhesive, even the low tack, if you hit it in the right spot, you can pull up finish and, and you know, unwantedly uh, wrinkle it. So I find the best way of marking this is just using a white gel pen. Uh, these pens are not as good. I need to get some better ones, but I like the white gel pen because it's easy to make. It doesn't go anywhere you don't really want it to. So in other words, you're not putting a half-inch piece of tape and, you know, taping up all of these sections up here that you could then potentially damage. Uh, and it wipes off with uh, a damp cloth, so you don't need a whole lot of it, and you can remove it effectively if you decide to go elsewhere. I am going to adjust that camera. Very bright today. Okay. So I have my line here. I, I know this is pretty much what I want, and I'm going to do, not being too careful about how close I get to this, I want to generally want to keep it about an eighth to a quarter inch away from my actual final margin, just because I'm giving myself, hey, hold on, hey, hey, what are you doing? Right. 
no, you cannot do that. You cannot, you cannot pull those wires. You cannot do that. I gave you another chance, and you've, you ruined it. You have to go out now. Vanished. He's done. To the to the oubliette with him. There we go. So that's pretty easy to see there. Halfway through smoking a turkey and you had a thunderstorm arrive. That's terrible. I hope you have better luck. I'm always continuously... Reminded of the hilarity of the Weber uh, smoker disaster in which they pushed a firmware update on Thanksgiving Day. The idea that a smoker would need a firmware update to begin with is, is horrendous to me, but it is the world we live in. So, Vanessa, welcome. This is a very basic uh, white gel pen. Nothing special. The Uniball ones are quite good. These ones are off-the-shelf generic ones from, like, Joann's, and they're not nearly as good, but they work just as well. Now, what you want to take note of, again, as I, as I said with the glazed alligator, this is a burnished finish on here. It's not a finish that is applied or layered on there. So if you're going on and you're wiping off your marks there, the emphasis should be on a damp cloth, not a wet cloth. You need very little moisture to lift that that the white gel mark off, because if you put too much water on here, you'll get basically what's an effect that we call in, in automotive painting dieback, uh, where you reactivate the surface enough to, it begins to move and flow again, and you lose the shine. So if you notice that you're putting water on your, on your glaze finish, and you're getting a dull finish back, that's effectively what you're doing. That little bit of moisture is loosening up the, this otherwise compressed grain, and uh, dulling it, because it's no longer as smooth as it once was. But in any case, we have our line marked out, and I'm just going to do a quick sanity check. Before I cut anything, I'm going to double check my template, look at it. Yep, that's correct. Yes, this is the right template, which you've got to make sure. And It would be hilarious if I cut it on, on too small of a template. That would be no good. Uh, yes, yeah, I have an old master-built smoker, which, Bob, I have yet to diagnose. I'll, I'll get to that. I've, I'm taking your advice. I just haven't got around to it yet. But I bought it for like 150 bucks about eight or nine years ago. It's very bare bones, nothing special. No wireless connectivity whatsoever, and it, that thing just works. So here's the frightening part. We're going to go ahead and cut this part, which is never fun. No matter how many times I do this, I am never excited to be cutting... A fresh hide apart. It's just frightening, no matter what. See, I'm going to start from the middle, because I find that sometimes if you're coming in from the outside and you get into these little bones, your knife can slip. It's a little, it's a little difficult. I'm going to start from the middle, then cut outward. And as you can see, even though I gave myself an eighth of an inch additional space, I'm still giving myself extra space, just in the event that God forbid the knife slips or something like that. It doesn't always happen, but it can happen. And if it does, having a little bit of extra space there as a safeguard is very helpful because there is no going back once you cut one of these. So I'm always extra careful to ensure that I'm doing uh, everything I can to give myself an out if I need to. So there's, there's the, the head cut off. This one here, because we're in really prime real estate down here, I'm not going to go too far out of my uh, margins here. I want to preserve as much of that usable hide as I can. Okay. 
together. So there's our back cut. Roll this back up and put it away. Now, you'll notice it's a little wrinkled, it's a little rolled up there, not to worry. We could get into, you know, boarding it or something like that, but the way I do these really isn't necessary. Once it's glued down, it generally does not have any problem holding, uh, holding itself flat. Take the straight edge and we're going to cut these. Hey, thanks for the subscription. Sirioth, I think I got your name right there. Now, don't throw these away. These are going to be very important. These flank pieces are going to be very important in just a second. I'll show you why. Uh, I don't recall what I paid for that hide. I would say probably around 350. No, that seems a little high. It's a grade one two. I, I'd say probably around 275 to 300 bucks seems about right for something of that. Of that uh, quality of hide there. Let's double check here. Yep, we're looking good there. And I'm going to trim this top edge a little bit closer. I realize I make a little bit of extra work for myself, you know, cutting this multiple times, but I like to be... I like to be careful. There we go. So that's a nice, that's a nice margin there. I'm actually going to do the same on the bottom. I'm going to trim this a little straighter down here just to make it easier in the bell skyver. And I have a, a treat for you guys today. Uh, I mentioned on the YouTube community posts a couple weeks ago that I have acquired another camera. And I had hoped to use this other camera for the top down. It's a nice 2K HD camera. But to my dismay, I discovered that it is a non, does not have a focal adjustment on it. It's a, it's a hard focus point. And uh, the software or whatever didn't seem to think that it could focus here this close. So I've relegated it to using it for the Skyver camera. I think I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and get a drop 150 bucks on like a 4K manual adjustable focus top-down camera. Because this one here works, but it could certainly be better. So we're going to use this new camera uh, for the Bell Skyver camera, which we're going to head over to in just a second. Now, you've heard me say not to throw these flank pieces away. These are important, and they are. And the reason that they're important is we're going to use these to test our Bell Skyver on. I'll show you what we're going to do on this. In the past, what I would do, and this is especially a problem on glaze because it is such a dense and resistant surface, uh, on glazed finishes, it is very frequent that you will get this scale pattern showing on the background. You can see just from the light hitting it how, how you know, the relief on that. That's, that's quite, quite noticeable. And in the past, what I used to do is I would actually split the entire piece of alligator on the bell skyver, which worked, uh, but it was very frightening and there was a great deal of risk involved. So what I do now is a bit different. And again, if you've watched some of my other streams, you've seen me do this before. The better method of doing this is to not glue the whole piece down. We glue only on the perimeter. We effectively create what is called a floating back, where this piece, this whole basically center section, is free to move independently of the interior. And what that means is, uh, when it comes to glazed in particular, uh, you get a lot less wrinkling of the surface. Because that's, that's a, a real problem with glaze, and that's why a lot of people don't like to work with it, uh, because you have to take these steps to work and get to work against that. Um, this effectively eliminates that. It not having to be on a fixed radius, it can just move on, a, on its own, prevents it from having that happen. The only, the only bits of wrinkling you get are on the very outside edges past the stitches where it's anchored down. So very, very effective way of doing that, very easy way of doing it. And what's going to be nice about this one, because I'm using Batero for the interior, I only need to have two pieces of it. Normally when I'm doing these, I'm doing this with very thin you know, goat skin or calf skin. And... You know, we're talking like 0.5 millimeter thick or less. And I usually end up having to do three layers of it. You know, the liner attached to an interface layer, and then that layer is attached to the, the alligator. Uh, not the case with this. The Batero, 
is stiff enough on its own to where I can basically just glue directly to the liner. This can resist it. This will flex on the outside, and it's actually quite a, a simple way of doing this. It is not an elegant way of doing it. It's quite messy to do, or at least for me, I, I seem to have difficulty keeping things uh, keeping things clean all the time. So I, I warn you beforehand, it is not elegant when I do it, and it is rather messy. But the final result is very good. So we're going to switch over to the uh, the camera here, the Bell Skyver camera, and we're going to do some test cuts on these flank pieces to make sure that, number one, we're getting the right thickness that we want, and number two, that we're not destroying the alligator as we go through there. So I'm going to switch to the Skyver camera, and what I would like you guys to let me know, I have it switching microphones. It should be pulling audio from the camera microphone rather than my desk microphone here. So I'm going to say a couple things, and please let me know in chat if you hear me, or also if you don't hear me, I will, I will be saying things. So if you don't hear any audio from it, or it's very muffled or very quiet, please let me know so I can try to do something with that. We're going to switch over to it here, and we're going to start the bell skyver. So hopefully you guys can hear me over here. Again, please do let me know. Let me know if you can hear anything. Just say something in chat real quick, and I'll, I'll give a quick look here. But this is my bell skyver. This is a Conso, basically Chinese knockoff. Uh, I've had this for around four, I've had actually for around four years now, four or five years. Yeah, it would have been four years because I got it in 2018. Um, and I bought this for about 1100 bucks new. Now they've since gone up. They're closer to 15, 1600 new on eBay. But for being effectively a knockoff, uh, it works very well. And the only modifications I've done to it, you can see here, I've added a, a gauge to tell me where my presser foot is aligned. And I changed the roller wheel from the stone wheel to a rubber wheel, and I find that works better. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you guys can hear me. I may have to adjust the uh, the volume on this a little bit, but I wasn't sure if that was going to work at all. So like I said, I have this, I think I've got it pretty well dialed in already, but we're going to test this first. This is really easy to see here, so I'm going to do this section right here. Actually, I'm going to do this section right here, and the reason I like to use the flank scales is because I know it's the exact same density and the exact same thickness as the actual piece I'm going to use. I'm not taking something that's totally different and testing it and then getting a different result when I try to put the, you know, the, the final product in there. This is effectively the exact same as what I'll be using. And this, you know, admittedly, this is too small to really use for anything other than maybe the smallest of zipper pulls or a keychain. So I'm not wasting, you know, an important piece of material by doing this. Rather, I am saving myself from potentially wasting an irreplaceable piece of material. So we're going to go ahead and do this. And what's nice about Skyving Gator is if the machine is set up right, it's very easy to see where the skive is. There you go. There you can see right on, right on the top there where it took it down there. We're down. I'll put that up to a... It's a little difficult to tell. might be easier to see on the... Uh, Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll measure it. We'll see how much that got taken down. So starting out, this piece was 0.7 millimeters thick. What have we skived it down to? Let's see. Taking it down to about 0.48. Now that doesn't sound like a significant savings, but it adds up quite a bit when you're thinking of it in layers. So again, if this was if I was doing this with three layers rather than two, you know, three three layers of uh, 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters of, of shaving, it comes out to a whole millimeter of thickness. So a little, you know, repeatedly ends up being quite a lot. So I'm going to do one more test just to make sure that that wasn't a fluke. And yep, we didn't we didn't eat the alligator with that. Let me step away just to check the chat real quick. Good. So good. We did not eat our alligator. The bell skyver did not consume it, which it does that from time to time. That's why we do these tests. So I feel confident enough in saying it's good to go ahead and run this through. So we're going to start with the two outer edges. These two outside edges are where we're going to have the greatest build of excess materials. So that's where we want to do most of our skiving. So there's that edge done. There's that edge done. And I think, 
I think I'm going to leave it at that. Because this is already relatively thin. Yeah, you know, you know what? I am going to I'm gonna go across the bottom. Or I want to sky the liner instead. I generally try not to skive too much on the top and bottom. Now, why is that? Because I know that when I'm stitching across the top, if it's very thin across there, it's effectively only going to be two layers of leather. You know, it's going to be my alligator exterior and my batero interior. And if I make that too thin, it's going to be difficult for me to get a nice-looking stitch line there. So I don't want to go too, too thin there. So on my top edge, I think I'm going to leave that alone. And on the bottom edge, it's kind of the same thing down there. Um, the bottom edge, the way I design my bifolds, they end up being a little bit thinner than the outside edge. So I try to leave a little bit of extra thickness there, unless I really need to take it down. So I actually think I'm just going to do the outside edges on my alligator. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut my, my wrist down, because obviously doing just a little bit across that small, you know, three and a half inches of, of distance there is a lot less risky than doing the whole nine and a half inches across here. Even though I'm pretty confident I wouldn't have any problems, I'm, I'm going to leave it go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, that's good enough. I'm happy with that. I'm not going to have any risk involved in something stupid happening and, and damaging that irreplaceable piece. A piece that is eminently more replaceable and less expensive is my Batero liner. So I can do as much as I want to this, and if I ruin this piece, that's frustrating, but I can reuse the interior elsewhere, and I can cut another one if I have to, because it is just a piece of veg tan versus, you know, again, an irreplaceable piece of alligator. So I've got a piece of Batero here that I'm just going to run across the bell skyver and check, because they do behave very differently. So you can see there, that dark spot there is where it's getting towards the, the outer layer there. We're seeing more of the dye come through, and I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to go ahead and do... There's that edge there. There's that edge there. And I think I'm going to go across the bottom on this. Yeah, I'm going to do one sky just across the bottom. There we go. So there's that all done. So this that's the value of this machine. You get a very consistent, very quick, very easy sky. Um, to, to try to do that by hand would have taken quite a long time, and it would not have been as consistent. That's a perfectly consistent, even sky across the entire length of that. And I can do that all day. Uh, there's no reason for me to just say, no, nah, I'm done. I could do every piece of leather in this shop in half an hour with that machine there if I had to. So if you're doing a lot of production scale or you need a lot of fine control over it, the Bell Skyver is a, a must-have for this kind of thing here. And I think we're done with it now. So let's go ahead back to the main bench. So it should have switched back to the right camera and the right microphone now. I'll mark out. You can mo you can pretty well see it on the on the camera there, but that there is where we skived. And again. On the alligator, I've left the bottom of the top alone. I've only done the two edges. Because I want to leave myself a little bit of extra thickness there for making a nice, clean stitch across the top there. So now we've come to the point where we're going to go ahead and attach these two. Do some quick, just some dry fitting of this to make sure that we've got the right... ...do. All good. Take a piece of wax paper here and lay this out. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put some glue on just this edge first and anchor it in place. That makes it a little easier to work with. Rather than trying to do this whole perimeter in one go, I'm going to do it in stages. And that way I can just kind of tackle each piece at a time and not really have to fight it too awkwardly. Any questions about that? Anything that, that I didn't properly explain something or there's something you want to see again, please do let me know. Good bit of glue on that. I know this is going to be my bottom here. Scale pattern, I want that to be on the top. Just going to visually 
Again, not being too particular about it. We're just going to visually line this. Good. No need to get more intense than that. Just with our thumbs, press this down. Work it down like that. Very good. We'll let that set for a moment. I, you have to forgive me. I, I'm presuming you're speaking Russian, but if you are, привет. I think that's close enough. <laughs> welcome to the welcome to the stream. So we've gone ahead. We've anchored this end down here. We're going to glue this on a 90 degree curve. And like I said earlier, we're only going to glue the perimeter. We don't want to glue anything in here because we want all of this in the center to flex. That prevents us from getting any crinkling or things like that. What volume of work was it when you decided the bell skyver was needed? That's a great question. Uh, it was not a lot. There was not a lot of... I wasn't doing a tremendous amount of work. Um, I did it um, mostly because I wanted to do better work. There were a couple things I had started to do where I really began to feel I need a machine to do this. Uh, and what it was when I started doing folded card slot tops. I was skiving them by hand and really ruining a lot of them. They were not turning out the way I wanted, and I kept thinking a machine would do this much, much better than I do. So that was the point where I really decided I, I, I need to get the machine. So it was not necessarily a volume decision, it was a, it was a, a quality decision, because it is better than I am at, at hand at skiving. Much better than I can do, and the fact that it's quicker to boot is an added bonus. So I really got it mostly so I could do better work rather than doing more work. But what I ended up finding was that being able to do more work led to me doing more work. So it was a, it was a critical, critical investment for me. And uh, anybody who's on the fence about it, I, I, would, I would recommend it. Why do I use Sewa glue the most? Um, I, I just like it. Uh, it's easy to work with. Um, it, is not, it is uncomplicated, and it works extremely well. So I find very little difficulty with it. Uh, it's just a, an all-around good glue. I'm looking up, and my mother has just pulled up outside and is getting out of the car. What is she? Oh, she's... Yep, there she is. She's got groceries for me. Now, hold on. We're going we're gonna to pause real quick here. My mother has brought me groceries. She brought me an avocado. Okay. Our glue is certainly set by now. Forgive the interruption there. <laughs> so we're ready to go ahead and go and do this. And like I said, this is rather messy. At least my doing of it. I think if I had to pick one failing for myself, it would be... Uh, I'm a, I'm a messy gluer, and I know that you know, it'll bring up the joke. Everybody in, in the leather discord makes fun of how much glue I use, and maybe I am just using too much, but I like using... I like being sure of my glue. We're going to do this in some stages here. I'm going to basically do this in three additional stages. I'm going to do... I'm going to get up to the fold here, just to anchor this down a little bit more. Then I'm going to do the fold right here in the center by itself, so I can just focus on working down and getting a bond at that fold. And then the final bit, this section here, I can do all in one go. So I kind of do it separately there. But one of the other reasons I like Sewa is that it, um, it has a good amount of working time. Not excessive, but enough to where if I glued this down and I didn't like the way it looked, I could very easily peel it back, scrape it off, and redo it, which I you know you have to do sometimes. You get a little bit of working time to be able to play with it and adjust it and get it the way you want, rather than like a contact glue, which is basically, it's on there. 
that's that. Start, even though I'm not actually at the fold yet, I kind of want to prepare for reaching that, so I'm going to work this down here. Just kind of using my fingers, working it, working it up towards the center here, working from the middle out to kind of work out any wrinkles or bubbles or things like that. And because we're not technically at something that's going to resist yet, we don't really have to hold it too much. Yes, Nick, you did hear correctly. Uh, for all of the things I have made, I think the contribution that I am most proud of is the, uh, the leatherworking discord. So I'll drop a link in chat here. Create an invitation here. Here it is in chat there for you. But a lot of a lot of well-known names in there. And the, the beauty of it is if you want to ask a question to somebody, something technical, something that is not something that's easy to just Google right away, um, you can basically get immediate feedback on that from people who know what they're doing. So it's a it's a a great resource if you're looking to uh, to do that. So please do feel free to come in, make yourself known. I'll caution you: we take it, we take leatherworking very seriously. So I'd say that is our one failing, and that um, we are very serious about doing it. So the casual, the weekend warriors generally come and go, but people who really want to, you know, aggressively improve and learn this skill, uh, you'll you'll find yourselves at home there. So as we can see with the say, well, that's already bonded. We're going to go ahead and do center here, and I'm using I'm using a lot of glue here. And that's rather messy to see. But if there's anywhere that's going to need to bond, it's going to be this spot right here. At least until we stitch it down in place. Take it. Try to put this where you can see it here. And I'm going to take it, I'm going to work from the inside out, working this down, trying to get the glue to come out the end there. I want to ensure that I have glue all the way to that edge there. And if you saw, I'm only doing about an inch and a half, two inches here. This is all I want to focus on. All I want to glue right now, all I want to worry about at this moment in time is just this fold. So I'm not worried about anything down here. This is all anchored down from the, the steps we did before. So I'm just focusing on putting tension and pressure to hold this particular point in place. That's it. That's all we want to do right now. Again, just continuously giving, giving pressure to these sections here, working from the top down. You're basically working from the inside out working that glue out to the edge and letting it hold. And by now, this should be enough. For, yep, we're good to go. So right there, you can see that's what that does. We hold the exterior in a position between opened and closed. And when we go to open it, it's a little hard to tell right now, but once I glue the rest of it down, you'll see. We've anchored it only on the outside perimeter, so this whole center section is free to float. So we prevent this section here from having to fight any tension and wrinkling, which is a, a big problem with glazed alligator. Go ahead and do this final section here. And before you ask, yes, I saw the glue that was on the wax paper. It's folded into the center there. In fact, you can, you can see it there. But um, like I said, I use no shortage of glue when I'm doing this because I like to know that this, that this is bonded. The downside to using so much glue is that it increases your amount of working time, so I have to hold it against tension for a longer period of time. But I know that when it's done, when it is finally cured, it will be a very, very good bond. Another advantage of the Sewa versus something alcohol or, or you know, solvent-based is that if we do get a little bit of glue in a place we don't want it to, it just comes up with water. So even if we are a little bit messy, 
it remains easy to clean. So now we're going to do, we've got everything else done. Work this down here. You'll notice that we're getting a little bit of flex, a little bit of tension fighting us. We're just going to work it out from the inside out. You'll notice it just laid right down. Now we're going to go ahead and really put the tension on it there. And you may see it lift a little bit because, again, the glue isn't fully cured yet. You are, you are fighting the curve of this, both on the 90 degrees and from the initial, you remember that this alligator wanted to flex a little bit and wanted to roll. You're fighting a little bit of that. You're fighting a, a multitude of forces here. Don't be afraid if you get a little bit of lifting. But already, that's pretty safe to say that we've done it. There we go. So there we have. There's our liner, and there's our exterior glued together. And when I stitch the top edge down, I'll show you. We'll flex it a little bit, and you'll see how it moves. But what I'm going to do right now, I think I'm going to take a quick five-minute break. We're going to grab some water. I'm going to hit the head, and then we'll come back. When I get back, what we're going to do, we're going to trim this to shape, and we're going to stitch the top edge. And I'll show you. Uh, I had a lot of people asking me, how do you align the stitch lines to have a continuous perimeter? So in other words, how do you get on two different lengths of surfaces? How do you get a stitch line that starts and ends at the same point? And I'll show you how I do that. It's actually very easy, but it makes for a very, very finished looking bifold. So let's take a couple minutes. Should only be about two, three minutes. I'm going to grab a drink of water. I recommend you do the same. Uh, if you have any questions about what you've seen so far or something I wasn't clear about, again, please do leave it in the chat for me there and, and I'll, I'll go over it. But thank you to all the newcomers who came in today. Uh, if you haven't yet, please do take a hot second and, and hit the like button for this video. It, it helps me, uh, I guess it helps YouTube push it to people. I'm not quite sure how it does that with live streams, but whatever. But in any case, I'd, I'd sure like it if you did. So hit the like button and then give me about two or three minutes. We'll, we'll come back and we'll, we'll move forward on this one. Okay, sorry for that. My throat tends to get a little dried out, and a glass of water is always welcome. 
Let's take a look at this poll here. So we still have, we have 24 votes now. And shockingly, edge paint is still narrowly beating out burnishing. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm rather surprised, but pleasantly surprised to see that. Because I, I find that um, a good burnish is a joy. It is, it is very nice to do. But getting a good edge, edge painted is an even better one, just because it is such a pain in the ass. Uh, nobody really likes doing edge painting, but I think the people who, who take the time to become good at it come to appreciate it, because it really is, there is definitely something to it. So, I hope, uh, I hope you try it out. We'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, if we get uh, the stitching done, I'll show you at least doing the top, top coat on this one here. We're done with the jig now. We can put this away. And for those curious about the jig that came from Ellen Valentine Leatherwork School, they don't cost a lot of money, but they are well worth the investment. Uh, if you don't want to spend the money to buy one, you can certainly just make your own. As you can see, it is just a couple pieces of wood. Um, but having that curve, that 90 degree curve to glue against is very helpful, uh, especially if you're doing anything that requires a fold like this. So I, I strongly recommend it. I, I Shared it on Instagram a, a couple months ago, and I had a couple people asking, what, what do you need that for? What are you doing with that? And it um, it, it helps. Get it. Just do it. <laughs> a pleasure to see my, my good friend and colleague Rushton here. Uh, I ordered some leather from him, in fact. I needed some more of that steel gray museum cap, and I ordered it from him. And that fool sent me far, far more than I asked for, including two of perhaps the most British-sounding snack foods I've ever heard, uh, jelly babies and hobnobs. Uh, and before anybody asks, because everybody who knows what the hobnobs are has questioned me, are they the chocolate ones? Uh, no, they are the Odi ones. Uh, they are not the chocolate ones. So, Rushton, I guess egg on your face. Everybody has told me that the chocolate ones are far superior. But I, I having just tried simply the Odi ones, I quite like them. I'm a big fan of the OD ones, so uh, thank you very much for sending those to me. Those are delicious. I've been working on those. You may remember seeing uh, one like this a couple weeks ago. Uh, uh, I had done uh, this exact same combination, the cherry glazed with the steel gray museum calf interior, and unfortunately uh, I was grieved to find out that the wallet was lost, so I had to, to make another one. Um, which should not bother me, but it does because, <laughs> and if you're watching, Daniel, forgive me, the, uh, the burgundy edge paint sucks. It is just no fun to use. I'm still working my way through on that one. I think I've got about another, you can see I've got some good block sanding done on here. I think I've got about another two or three thick layers to go to get this one finished up here. But otherwise, it's all together. So very, very pretty little, pretty little piece here. So that's what I've been Kind of working on here. This is using a piece of alligator neck. It was all I really had left. It was either this or a piece of the sacrum for uh, for using this one, and he chose the neck, which I like. I think the neck is an underutilized part of the alligator. Again, because you get some very interesting scale transitions. You get these nice kind of not quite bubbly, but very round and you know textured scales on the outside, and flatter, larger scales on the center line. So very very interesting. So this one will be this will be fun to photograph when it comes time to it. Well, the uh, I'm going to make something to match with it. This the fellow sent me. This is very neat. This is a bottle opener, apparently. I'm going to make a very cool matching case for that. Some nice Damascus pattern on this. Very neat. Very very nice feeling. It would be fun to open a bottle with this. <laughs> And with that done, it is time to back on with it. Yeah, they're, um, the Jelly Babies are very strange, and I like them. I like the flavor, but the texture is very bizarre. I'm, I love gummies. They're one of my favorite things to eat. These ones are like, when they say jelly, man, they're not. it's like just straight jelly, like liquid inside. They're very, very strange texture. But in any case, thank you so much for sending those to me. Always appreciated. So, carrying on, I it looked like it does. I it does look like the Wu Tang logo, doesn't it? <laughs> Here, let's you know, we'll pull it up again. See if you can. So 
Somebody confirm, is this Wu-Tang? I think it is. I'm not sure. Help me out here. Is that? Confirm or deny? Either way, it's a cool piece. And it already has a fairly, fairly nice uh, sheath for it. I think I'm probably going to replicate what this one is already because it, it works very well and it's it's quite attractive. But it would be more attractive if it was alligator. I I think it is. Yeah, I think I think you're correct. <laughs> Chelly babies used to be called unclaimed babies, named after children abandoned in Victorian times. Well, Russian, that sure as hell doesn't make me like them any better. So, my my word, man. Anyway. We have our back done now, and it's still a little difficult to tell, but once I get it stitched down, you'll see it a little bit better. We now have to go ahead and get this trimmed to size. That, I'm going to, kind of awkwardly, I'm working against all of the effort I did just to get it on the curve here, and I'm pressing it as flat as I can to mark fine on it. But don't worry, it'll spring right back. Here. That there is our final true dimensions. We can trim this down to shape, and we will be able to then trim our interior to match it. Notice the interior is trimmed on three out of four sides, the top, the two sides, but you notice on the bottom, you can see where my lines are scribed. It is not trimmed down there yet. The final dimensional adjustment will be to, after I have this trimmed to its shape, to match the interior to its size. And that will make more sense when I actually do it. Just bear with me. We'll get there. We're working on it. I watched, um, if you haven't yet, I recommend watching uh, Nobody, that movie with uh, Bob Odenkirk. And it has, uh, it has RZA in it. It's very cool. I was very happy to see that. Go there, so there's... That's the top line. This bottom line here. And it's a little tricky because you always... Even after pressing it flat and everything, you always lose a little bit of... It always deforms a tiny bit when you're trying to do this. It's, it's kind of a pain. But it's, I don't normally cut against this acrylic because I'm, I'm afraid of damaging the acrylic, but I think today I'm going to. I'm not using a great deal of pressure. I'm just kind of letting the knife work under its own weight. Not worried about making multiple strokes on that. It's fine. Top and bottom cut. Here, we're going to do the outside edges. There. So there's our final shape for the outside piece here. Yeah, I've got a little teeny little bit of glue on there. No big deal. We're just going to take, take my damp cloth, run over it with that. This will also remove any little bit of a 
the white gel pen that's remaining. Here we go. So that's a that's a pretty looking piece of alligator. So Bob, there is your back and your interior put together. What you're going to have on the outside that is a lovely combination. Now looking at it, I've noticed I've got a little bit, you can just barely see that we've got a teeny tiny little bit of delamination right there on the center mark from me stretching it out a little bit. So we're going to take a moment here, work some glue in there. Oh. Clamp right there to hold it in place. We'll let that set up for a second. So now, like I was talking about, when I do my bifolds, I like to have the stitch line contiguous. No breaks in it. So no breaks here from the top edge to the uh the interior edge. And how we do that is we're gonna we're gonna basically we're gonna transfer some of these stitching holes from this piece. Do this piece and I'll show you how we do that. That way we can establish where the line starts and stops. And then once we know that, once we have those lined up in the same spot, it doesn't matter what the difference in total length is, as long as it starts and stops in the same place, we're good. Blue is set up now. So What I'm doing here, I'm lining this up. Let me make sure I've got the right. I'm trying to remember which is the top and which is the bottom. This is the top. Yeah, this one's the top. Okay. We know that this is the right size. We know that everything else here, other than this bottom edge, which doesn't matter yet, is also the right size. So we're just going to take this and line that up on the outside edge and on the top. Basically just pressing this up against the corner here. And I'm going to take a needle and I'm going to push it through the stitch hole right there. I've got a teeny tiny little mark. And I know that there is where that stitch line starts. So my first hole has to be punched there. And when I line those two edges up, they're going to work. What do I focus on when choosing the color of the product? Color is something I want to do a whole, <laughs> an entire discussion about. It's a difficult one to do. Now this one was made relatively easy in that uh, Mr. Bob kind of knew what he wanted already. So we had some colors kind of picked out already that were that were known to be things that he liked and things that conveniently worked well together. A lot of it comes down to just basically experience. But as I, as I say many times, I have a bit of an added bonus to it. That I spent almost 20 years as a car painter. And that is something where color matters quite a bit. So I, I'm, I'm not new to the world of, of colors and accents and how they work together. So I came into this with that knowledge already. But... Having, if you're not familiar with a color wheel, having one is very important. Generally, not always, but a safe bet is if you have a color wheel, look at the color where it is on the wheel, look at the opposite side, and there are your two colors to put together. Generally, that is a safe bet. Um, not always, but generally. So that's if you, you want the absolute most simple basic color theory, there you go. And it, it all goes downhill from there. Looking at the way the colors work together, looking at the way the light reflects from them, looking at the uh, the stitching color against each one is is something that you just get an angle, get, you you get a handle for with experience. But in general, here's a here's a rule that I find works very well and very rarely is uh, contrary. Pick two colors and stick with it. If you're gonna make a wallet and you're gonna say, okay, I want this wallet to be be different colors. Pick two. Just do that. So in other words, this wallet is effectively only two colors. It is green, 
it is brown. Now, granted, this is a very red brown, but it is still brown nonetheless. So everything is based on that. Everything is either going to be green or it is going to be brown. And it depends on how you want to look. We know in this case that we wanted to have emphasis on the stitches. So, okay, if the interior is green, then we want to show the stitches they're brown. Easy enough. Uh, the edges, from my own personal experience, I like to have the edges matching the exterior. So, end of story, they're brown as well. Um, that's very simplistic because, again, if you look at the last week's stream when I chose the thread colors, you'll notice that I, I went through four, four different colors of thread to try to find the right brown that I liked. So it goes into great depth from there, but it's easy to make two colors work together, and it's much more difficult to make three colors work together because you're looking at the two colors and you're looking at the, the various tones and hues of them and it's easy to kind of make that work. When you add a third one in, it has to work with both of the other two colors, and that becomes very difficult. So if you're just starting out with color and you're just trying to get a handle for it, just go with two. Don't make it more complicated than you need to. Uh, picking two colors that work very well together will look infinitely better than a bunch of colors that look okay together. And that's the thing where I think people get hung up. I think in this uh, craft... There's a great emphasis on finding your own style and making yourself known to people and you're know, standing out from, from everybody else doing it. And I think people tend to, to kind of pick the low-hanging fruit of saying, I'm going to use some wild colors and I'm going to do some, something crazy with this. And you can, but nine times out of ten it just ends up looking bizarre unless you're very, very good at working with colors. And some people are, and some people aren't. <laughs> so take it slow, work with just a few colors, and once you get a feel for matching two colors together, then you can work with adding in a third uh, and go from there. So it, uh, it's just the kind of thing you have to do a lot of to really get a feel for it. We're ready now to go ahead and punch some holes here. So if you look at the top here on each side, up where my index fingers are, you can see where we've made our, our index marks. And those correspond, again, those are exactly with where these stitch lines start. So when we make our holes there, we can join those two panels together, and those two points are going to be indexed to each other. They will match. And that's how we can do a different length, but have the stitch start and end at the same point. Now, one thing that's important to note is I try to punch from the same direction. So when I did this interior piece, I punched from the inside out. So when I'm doing this, I also want to do the same. I want to punch from the inside out so that the angle of the stitch also matches the position of it. That's important to remember. I've got just very crudely marked out there my corner line, so I kind of know the direction I need to go with it. Using the two-prong chisel, just punching by hand, working around that corner. We can see there those two line up just right. Do the same for the other side, and then we'll just walk it towards the center and meet in the middle. I'm not going to punch the center yet. I'm going to come in from the other side and make sure that the stitch holes line up with each other. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But that way, if I have to fudge a stitch, if I have to make one longer or shorter than the ones around it, it is much easier and less noticeable to do it right on this center point. Because generally, it is always at an angle, whether the wall is closed or open. So if there's any difference in the stitch there, it is much less noticeable than it would be in a section that's flat or straight.
Again, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop just short of the center line there, so you can kind of see there. We're going to take a look, and we're going to see how well the chisels line up with these holes. Do they meet, or do they overlap? And that's pretty damn close, actually. Close enough to where I actually could just go. Two of those stitch holes are about a tenth of a millimeter shorter than the ones around them, but you would never notice. Perfect. I'll call that perfect. Okay, for now. And before I stitch them, I'm going to hammer these holes closed. The other side, too. And I do that because, especially on something that's like this, where it is not super thick, uh, you want to have the holes nice and tight so that your thread will hold and make a nice slanted stitch on both sides rather than having a lot of room to just kind of fall out of place. General rule of thumb for thread length, at least for mine, for my stitch distance, is four times the length is enough. There's a length there. Two. Yeah. A little bit extra just in case. Needles threaded. I think I will digest the camera or not. I don't know. Let's see. All right. I'm going to try something today. I'm going to try something with the camera here. Bear with me. Hold on, I'm not gonna, we're not going to leave it like that. <laughs> that works okay. Yeah, that's all right. Perfect. It's backwards, but nobody would really know that, so that'll do. If, uh, if Rushton is still here, thinking about the other day, this being uh, towards the end of July now, <laughs> being the history nerd that I am, I was thinking of uh, the Battle of Britain in 1940, July and August and September of 1940, how it's just now... If this were 1940, it would just now really be starting to heat up and getting quite frightening for people. I was watching uh, Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk, and I think that is a fantastic film. Interesting because it is um, easy to mistake it for a war movie, which it is not. Uh, it's really it's a it's a suspense movie. It's a thriller, I guess you'd say, and that. Not so much great action or things like that, although there are certain certainly amazing scenes in there, but it is just a, a sense of continuous foreboding and unease, which I think is a very unique take on that particular encounter. 
what size pricking irons am I using? I'm using three millimeter distance pricking irons, so that's nine stitches per inch. I'm using the Leatherwork School, the Ellen Valentine or Jun Lin chisels. I think those are a fantastic deal. Excellent quality for the price. You get three chisels with them. But yeah, Russian, I, I saw Dunkirk after um my wife and I went to see Darkest Hour in a in a local movie theater. And uh, appropriate to the to the title, uh, it was the darkest movie theater I have ever been in. I was sitting next to an older gentleman who, within the first 15 minutes of the movie, it was so dark that he actually fell asleep and snored through the entire film. It was it was actually it was quite charming. But uh, I really liked Darkest Hour, and then when I came home, I was like, well, we should. You should watch Dunkirk, because neither my wife or I had seen it. So that was a great follow-up to it. And I would love it if they did a... Um, I'd love to see a Battle of Britain, a new movie. I guess, I guess it would be a remake of the, of the classic, which is very good still. It holds up well, I think. I think, it's, uh, I think it's kind of a shame that we have not seen much of the European air war in film yet. I think, I think the closest we get to it is that... Uh, Travesty, Michael Bay film, Pearl Harbor, that opening sequence where he volunteers to fight the Battle of Britain. I remember seeing that and thinking, no oh, man, this is going to be good. And then seeing all of the, uh, the marketing and everything, oh man, this is going to be good. And wow, it was bad. Uh, what, a, what a bad movie. Forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I can't read Cyrillic. But uh, this one here, this pony I made early on, and I've been using it ever since. I just made it out of made it out of scrap wood, and it works well enough. So I see no reason to change it. Got a little piece there. I found a little bit of the edge there. That's you can just make it out right there. It's delaminating a teeny tiny little bit. So we're gonna work some glue in there. But I've always been particularly fascinated and taken by the Battle of Britain. Easy, easy battle to get interested in. But, uh, and it's funny you mentioned that, Russian, because I want to talk about that. You know, people always remember the American volunteers and things like that, and the, the multinational, you know, commonwealth nature of uh, the RAF at the time. But I, I do think they need to talk more about the Polish and the Czech pilots who were there. I think it was, what was it, number 303 squadron? We ended up having the, some of the highest success, actually, I think the highest success rate of interceptions and, and you know, victories of anybody during the entire the entire battle there. Purely for the fact that uh, it's not commonly realized, but the Polish Air Force had a pretty high level of training. They were just ill-equipped to face the Germans. You know, their, their, their equipment was not up to the, the quality of their training. But not only that, they were also experienced. So they had fought in Czechoslovakia and in Poland and in France and then flown to Britain to continue on the fight. It's quite a quite a moving tale to imagine that. I think of the uh, the sheer desperation, the circumstances they mu they must have felt themselves under. The pressure and the strain must have been absolutely tremendous. I'm always uh, rather taken by the story of uh, Reginald Mitchell, the uh, the famed aircraft designer from Supermarine, the man who basically, not single-handedly, but certainly had a, had a large part in designing the, uh, the Supermarine Spitfire, a machine which many have called the, uh, the savior of Britain, even though it's a... Uh, much lesser respected cousin, the Hawker Hurricane, did equally as much, if not more, during the Battle of Britain, at least. R.J. Mitchell was a hell of a man. Screw around a little bit with my thread there.
Reginald Mitchell and Supermarine, the company, kind of made their name designing race race aircraft. Seaplanes, actually, for the Schneider Cup Trophy, which was a series of seaplane races. If you look at some of the aircraft that uh, Mitchell designed for these races, they bear a striking resemblance to the Spitfire, for, you know, for good reason. But he was, um, he being uh, an Englishman, watched the rearmament of Germany with some degree of alarm, especially the Air Force, and he saw the, because of the antiquated aircraft were being then put in service in the late 20s and early 30s. And at the same time, he saw the Germans you know, developing ever more advanced and more powerful aircraft. And he watched that with great concern. And I always find it fascinating that effectively the Supermarine Spitfire came about by means of a private venture from the Supermarine Company. There were calls for you know, certain aircraft, and you know, they had made entries to them, but none of them had been accepted. And Mitchell took it upon himself to continue the development of these designs that were rejected to make something better for them. Both because it was his job, but also because he saw it as his duty to his country to, to give them something that could withstand, that could resist these new technologically superior aircraft the Germans were using. We're almost done with this stitch run here. And we'll get to test it, and I'll show you how it lines up with the piece it's measured from. You know, Russian, I still haven't watched that Spitfire documentary. I've been meaning to for years now, and I haven't had a chance to yet, but I'll get around to it here. Have you guys had any relief with your heat wave yet? We had our own little one here for the past two weeks. It's finally starting to cool down. We had some really delightful thunderstorms move through last night. We're supposed to have about a 10 degree temperature drop this week. Almost done here. What's been nice about stitching this particular run is I've been looking at the edge here. Only had that one little spot. Didn't get glue all the way in. Everywhere else, got a nice clean bond here. In addition to the mechanical bond from the thread, I've got a nice chemical bond all the way through from the glue. And then when we put our layer of edge paint on there, it's going to be an even better one. Yeah, that's, that's quite miserable. I think that's, what, nearly 100 degrees Fahrenheit? That is not good. I'm blessed being here near the Great Lakes. We only ever really get up into the mid-90s at the very peak of summer, which is what we had all last week. Generally, it's closer to low to mid-80s, which is quite nice. Most ready to do the back stitch here. Okay. 
turn the fill tooth on so I can get that warmed up. I glue our thread in, and then after I hammer the thread down, we're going to crease and edge paint this top edge. Yeah, that's miserable, Robert. I, uh, I feel for you there. Camera back around. There we go. Okay. Here's our stitch line. Let's go ahead and hammer it closed. You can see the you can see a bit of the difference between the two sides there. So on the right side here, this is not hammered. You can see look for, look at the highlights on the top of the, the thread there. You can see where the, the leather is still kind of puckered out and how large the holes are. Hammering it closes that down and makes that nice and flat. Oh. What we'll do, go ahead and test these out here. I'll show you how this is going to work. Poke a needle through each hole there. So I'm going to poke a needle through the interior to the exterior. There's our first attachment there. And let's try it on the other side here. There we go. When we line that up there, and we use our needles to kind of test those together, what we have, we have a stitch line that matches on the inside and the outside, even though the exterior length is different. That's how we do that. So then the thread that joins the, the, the two pieces together will start here, wrap around the bottom, and end here. And it'll leave these two independent stitch lines alone up on the top there. end up with a nice, consistent, contiguous stitch line now. Needles here. While I'm waiting for the filatus to heat up, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trim the bottom of these two pieces here. But I have two pieces that are exactly the same size. Although before that, I need to round my corners off. There's our interior and our exterior ready to go. We're going to line these up and trim off the bottom of the interior. We have now a dead heat for edge painting versus burnishing with 26 votes, 13 votes apiece, an unlucky number. in favor of each. So what I'm doing here, I'm just going to lay this flat, and rather unscientifically, I'm simply going to lay these on top of each other, line up the top edge, line up the stitches, I'll take a pen, this as flat as I can get it here. Here. So it is worth noting that while doing it this way sometimes, these two lines may not necessarily be the same exact height. And that comes about from, occasionally when trimming this, 
sometimes the ruler is not exactly perfectly aligned and you get maybe a tenth or a quarter of a millimeter extra height on one side than the other. Rather than trying to measure all that out and make it perfectly 100% square for something that no human could ever actually see, uh, it is easier just to simply line it up here and just trim it as it is to this here. And even with a, with a difference of that minor, even if you put the two sides together, it is not something you see. Go ahead and take the straight edge. See how these line up here. And in this case, it's dead nuts on. Everything is just as it exactly should be. That line there, just right. Take that. Not, again, not uh, putting great pressure on the knife, just kind of letting it cut at its own pace. Takes a couple different passes. I'm not worried. There. Perfect. Now, if you look closely, you may see some scribe marks down here on the bottom, which indicates that my initial measurement of this piece was a little bit larger than what it ended up being. That's not to worry. These edges here will all get creased, and then there will be stitches there as well. So if you do this my way, and you find that your measurement is somewhat off a little bit, it all comes out in the wash when it's all finished. If you don't believe me, just trust me. <laughs> we'll do ahead. We'll do a quick double check. Good. In fact, actually, now that I look at it, this one could be trimmed a little more. In fact, both sides could have a little more taken off. Trim that a little bit more. Here. And here. Take about that much off. Not very much at all. See how that lines up. How does that look? It's good. I want to look. One needs a little bit more. What size are my alphabet stamps? I believe. The box says 14 points. I think what may have happened on that, I think I may have had my knife at a little bit of an angle there. Might be why I had that discrepancy with the size. It's always a little bit awkward to cut because it's not exactly flat. I'm working against the step of the interior there. So sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error to get those just right. Now, I feel good in saying that now I have my pieces are now the right height. They match. They can be joined together. Oh, Bob, trust me, if you're nervous, you're not nearly as nervous as me. That's never... That's always my least favorite part of doing these. <laughs> There's a lot that can go wrong with that if you're not careful. Teeny tiny little bit of glue there. And one thing I am going to do, while I have these two pieces separated, I am going to polish the inside, because I'm never going to get a better time to do that than now. As far as which one made me more nervous, doing that or cutting the alligator, I would say, quite honestly, doing that cut right there is never fun. Now, there's probably a better way of doing it, but by now, I'm kind of set in my ways, so. <laughs> and arguably, even though it's inelegant, it does work well for me, so. 
get that little bit of polish now while the two pieces are separated. Do the same for the interior panel. Okay. By right, now, our Philatus is heated up. Go ahead and start burning some creases. And again, before I do that, I'm going to take a little bit of green scrap and test my creasing tip on it. That looks the way I want it to, and it's not too hot. So it's not going to burn the leather. Crease along the top edge there. And now that I know that these are the same size, that I know I'm not going to have to trim this dimensionally or anything else, I'm going to make my center crease along the bottom there. Because when these are put together, it's almost impossible to get the creasing tip up against the edge there. So I would either have a small gap on either side of uh, opening the center. And even if I could, Trying to do the back side would be equally difficult because, again, I'm trying to do it on a, basically a floating curve there. So once I know that my dimensions are good, they're not going to change, I'll crease this bottom section here. And I know that when I line it up, that crease is going to be in line with the bottom of those two panels, the two card slots there. Do the outside now. So there's our creasing, and then having done the outside of that, I'm just going to go very lightly back over the side, clean up that crease line again. So we're ready to actually dress this edge. So we'll actually do we'll do a little bit of edge painting here today, on albeit a very simple edge, but nonetheless. After we've creased it, stitched it, and everything, we're ready to go ahead and put some edge paint to cover up this top edge here. I'm going to take my block sander. Just work it lightly over the top edge. By this point, there shouldn't be many inconsistencies in the surface, but there may have been a little bit of glue that seeped out. And sometimes during the course of creasing, you get a little bit of deformation of the edge there. That quick little sand there takes out any of that stuff. Got my damp cloth handy, and we're going to use uh, Uniter's Havana to do this because I find it's a nice match the color of that cognac. Almost a dead ringer for it. There are endless ways to apply edge paint. I have come across what I find to be the most simple method for me, and I am made fun of at great length for it in the Discord. I'm just going to put a little bit on my fingertip. Just using surface tension, I'm going to go ahead and apply it there. And if I do it right, I don't get any spilling over the edge. But even if I do, which in this case I had very, 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 very little, take my little damp cloth there, just zip it along the edge there. Because it's still liquid, it just comes right off. With any paint, and with any method of application, the key to getting it, or rather the key to cleaning up mistakes, is to get them while the paint is wet. If you wait until the paint is dry, you'll have an unholy time trying to clean it up. But if it's wet, it just wipes right off. Right, so we have our first layer of paint on there, and it doesn't need to be too perfect. It doesn't need to be very thick. It doesn't need to be super consistent. This is just fine, because we're going to take our filatouche, which is still heating up over there, one handle of it, 
and melt this into the edge. Now, if you don't have a filatus, you don't need to do this. Um, I think it works better, and I think it's certainly a lot quicker. But there's nothing I'm going to do here today with the filatus that you can't do without. It will usually just take more steps, more sanding, and more paint. So do not be dismayed if you do not have one of these tools, but still, I would recommend getting one. Uh, both for the ability to do consistent and clean creases and also for the ease with which you can paint edges with it. So this edge paint is starting to tack up. We didn't put a whole lot on there so it doesn't have a, a super lengthy dry time on this. Always my favorite streaming literal paint drying. <laughs> That's good stuff. So while we're doing this, this is going to be a little bit of a wait time on this. If there are any questions or things like that, now would be a great time to ask them. And I see again, we're still, the, the number of votes is going up, so we don't have an unlucky number anymore, but we're still in a dead heat between edge painting and burnishing. Here is almost ready. When it comes to paint drying, uh, the biggest thing that affects it is airflow. Heat certainly helps. Uh, and I know people use dry booths and things like that, but even the dry booths do not rely purely on, on heat. They rely on airflow. And that's what really is wicking away the solvents and things like that and curing the paint. So if you want to have your paint cure quicker, number one, put it in a warm spot. That helps. You know, less, less humidity in the air helps, and a little bit of heat helps. And have a, a light bit of airflow over the top of it. That makes a big difference. What machine do I recommend getting first, skiving, the creaser, or the filatus? I would honestly say if you're making small goods, um, most people will get more use. If you're looking to make small goods that are fine, uh, I'd recommend getting the creaser first, the creaser and the filatus, because you can get that's a multi purpose machine. It doesn't do just creasing, it does both. Uh, you get the paint, if you buy the tips, you can do creasing and paint spreading. So you'll spend less and you'll arguably get more uh, use, utility immediately out of a creasing machine. Uh, there's plenty of them available now and the prices have come down quite a lot. So maybe four or five hundred bucks you can get a machine that does both and does it very nicely. And that really adds a lot to the appearance of goods. Having that little crease around the edge and being able to do things with edge paint quicker and nicer really opens up a lot to people. The bell skyver, you'll kind of know when you need it. Um, if you're doing it by hand and you're getting the results you want and you're not spending a great amount of time, if you're not pressed to do a lot of skiving at one time, you probably don't necessarily need one. But you'll start to, it's kind of thing where you'll start to feel, it's like, man, I'm taking a, a long time doing this or I'm having great difficulty doing this. Then you'll kind of start to know, you know it's, it's time to look at the bell skyver. And that, you know, in a, in a craft where everybody's doing different things, everybody's need is a little bit different for it. So in my case, I got the creaser first and had great use from it. Hey, thank you for joining. I, I, I wish I could pronounce your name, but again, I, I can't read Cyrillic. But thank you for, for coming in and having a good time. As I was saying, everybody's need will be different. So it's kind of hard to say, like I said, in my case, I got the creaser first and then the bell skyver not too long afterwards. So now I've got the creaser well heated up. This is, uh, this is very hot. We are actually going to melt the paint. And the paint is dried enough to where there are no more pools of liquid sitting on the top. It's good to go ahead and hit it with the, uh, the, the tip. This is a zipper cutting tip. I picked this up from Matt Nudai for using this. There are specific spreader tips, like a wax spreading tip that looks like a little sword. I find this works very nicely. Go ahead and go over this. We're going to spread the paint out. Because when the paint dries, you'll notice that as the solvents evaporate, it will shrink. And it will shrink back into small crevices and low spots between the two layers. So you want to get the heat to spread it into those and fill those sections. It saves you the time of having to go back and build up additional paint in there. You're able to just kind of move it in there with the heat. And everywhere else where it's already flat, you basically just get a kind of it up and, and a better bond to the fibers of the leather there. This becomes a much more sturdy surface for more paint to be attached on top of it.
one of the great misunderstandings of paint is that people simply think, oh, you know, adding a primer is all you need, and then you'll get bond over it. The, the bond is, of your paint is only as good as the layer underneath it. So even just putting a primer over top a smooth edge does not necessarily guarantee that paint's going to bond. Melting it in with heat does a, does a pretty good job of it, though. Any tips or recommendations for dialing in the bell skyver? Um, yes. I would say that having a micrometer helps a lot uh, in being able to measure the front and back of your sky. If you're trying to get a perfectly level sky, being able to mic out each side of it to determine which side is taller than the other one helps quite a bit. And once you kind of know that, you can make some basic marks and guidelines on your machine to help you do that. Um, learning to sharpen the bell helps a lot, which is something I still struggle with even at this point. Um, generally, uh, I noticed that on mine, it took me a couple years to figure it out, but my, my grindstone was not aligned with where I had my bell sitting, so I'd have to move the knife back and forth a lot. Uh, which was not very convenient until I realized I could simply take the thing apart and move where my grindstone was to always have it in the place where it needed to be. So doing a little bit of maintenance to it with that helped a lot. I did change out the feed wheel. Uh, I got one for $9 on Amazon, uh, and that's about it. I haven't done anything else to it. People make a big deal out of having you know a different a second servo motor so that you can run the blade at a different speed than the feed wheel, and that certainly makes a difference, but... I've managed to go four years without having that, so I think I'm doing okay without it. So I'd say don't get so hung up on spending a bunch of money to modify the machine. The machine works pretty good out of the box, uh, as long as you have very basic mechanical skills, you can figure out how it works. They're not complicated. There's not a lot going on in there. There's a motor, and it spins a shaft, and that's about it. A couple belts drive a few of the attachments, and that's it. There's nothing else to it. There's nothing complicated in that machine. Figuring out which dials adjust which parts of it can take some time. But again, simply looking at it and seeing what does what, within a day you should be able to figure it out. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm always kind of perplexed at people who, who treat these machines as mystical. They are not. They are anything but mystical. They're very simple. They're about the simplest machine you can get. Like I said, it's a single shaft. That's all. <laughs> so with that melted in. I'm going to go over it and scuff it a little bit with some 320 grit. This is just taking off any little lumps and bumps. Kind of working over the edges there to take any lips off that have built up. We have a nice base layer there. We're going to go ahead and add a thicker layer here. And I'm going to do it the same way. I'm going to use my fingertip again, but I'm going to build up more paint on here. I'm going to get more paint on my fingertip and really kind of roll it onto that edge, because I want to get a nice tall bead on there. I'm really just using surface tension to apply this. That's all that this is doing. I'm using my finger to hold the paint in place. I'm rolling it off of my paint onto the surface and just letting surface tension pull it off onto the surface. One spot there where I had a little bit of this paint, but again, we're just going to go in with the Towel and wipe it all off. Just liquid so it comes right off. A little bit out of practice with this. I haven't done many edge painted wallets in a hot second here. So. like that. Let that sit up a bit. I'm going to put a little bit more paint here in the middle. Hold that up a little bit more. Away the excess. Got a little bit of excess paint that stayed in there. I'm not worried about that. When I come back and hit it with some alcohol, all of that's going to lift right off. Only a very, very little bit of excess paint on there. Now we'll let that set. While we're doing that, there are other things we can do. First, let's make sure that I've got all the paint off my fingertip. I 
it doesn't take much to get it off here. Get your finger a little damp just to braid the rest of it off. That's another thing that any, any other excess paint that stays on there, if it's not on a prepared surface, in other words, if you get some paint on a surface that is just smooth, in other words, the interior of your leather, if you can't wipe it off, uh, you can probably just pull it off with a rubber eraser because, again, it's not to a surface that it really wants to bond to. Paint wants to attach to a rough surface, a scuffed or sanded surface. On a smooth surface, nine times out of ten, it will just roll off if you hit it with enough pressure. I'm not too particular about being excessively cautious with that because I know I can clean it off. We're going to let that dry. We're going to move on to the interior. Now I know that, again, I've taken the time and I've measured all this and I've lined all this up, so I know this is the final shape of this. I'm good to go in, round my corners, and punch my holes on the inside. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And if you've watched my some of my other streams or some of my videos, you know that I kind of have an unusual way of punching the holes. I'll punch my interior holes, glue my exterior to it, and then re-punch through the holes. And I find that doing it that way, although it takes a little bit more time, lets me get a very clean, very accurate uh, hole punch arrangement. I get nice, clean, straight lines on the inside, and nice, clean, straight lines on the outside, and they line up just right. I find that doing it that way Kind of breaks it up a little bit and makes that simpler to do. So I'm just waiting for that paint to dry. I'm going to go ahead and find other things to do. In this case, I'm going to punch some holes. Lightly mark out stitch lines. I'm being very careful with this because it's easy for that tool to slip and leave a mark in a place you don't want it to. You want to be quite ginger with it. We don't need to make a very deep line, to, we just need one that we can see. If you look very closely, in fact, it's so shallow it won't even show up on the camera. There it is. You can just barely make it out. That's all we need. Just something that you can catch your eye on and line up your chisels with. Here. So I'm going to come down there, and I'm going to stop at the corner. I'm going to start here again at this other line and meet in the corner. Because like I did earlier, remember when I stopped in the center while punching the holes for the exterior for the outer piece there, if I have to fudge any difference in space between the stitches, it is easier to do that and hide it around a corner than it is on a straight line. So we'll, we'll see what happens. My guess is these are going to line up quite good. But if I have to do a shorter or a longer stitch, it'll look nicer if it's around the corner. Let's see where we end up here. There's our corner there, and if my gut is right, this two-pronger should fit perfectly between there, and it does. It's perfect. Tips of these kinds bridge that corner just perfectly. That always makes me happy. Go ahead and do the other side now.
And if this is all right, we should have the same phenomena here, which we do. Perfect. These two tines of the corner punch fit just perfectly right there in the corner. In the end, we didn't need to fudge any stitches at all. They were all perfect, which does not always happen, but it's nice when it does. We have our holes punched on the inside, and what will happen is when we're ready to do it, when we're ready to join the exterior to it, I have some nice clean holes to punch, all, punch through already. Hello, a Falco greetings. Welcome from Ohio. <laughs> so while we've been doing that, we've got this here. Our second layer of edge paint has dried now. And it's dry enough to where I feel confident going back over this with a filatus. Now you could either do this, you could block sand this. Again, like I said recently, I've been... I've been of the opinion that going back and spreading it with the filatus rather than really removing it with the sandpaper is better. But I haven't done enough of it to really have a definitive opinion on that, so I'm still kind of experimenting with that. There'll be more on that as I have something more to show. Just making quick, light strokes with this. Because when you start adding more paint and trying to heat it, You start getting some bubbling if you if you lay the filatus on too long. So you have to be very quick and delicate with it so as not to bubble the paint. That's one drawback of this method, but I'm kind of working on that. I think I've got a, a good handle for how to do it without causing too much of that. I'm just going over it and I'm just looking for any little low spots or things like that. Just trying to slowly coax the paint into filling them. Again, just using kind of quick, broad strokes to, to do that. I think that looks pretty good, actually. So like I did earlier in the stream, with that in place now, we can get a better finish from that. I'm just going to take a dry cloth and just buff it aggressively, building up some heat, building up some friction. And that will take down any little surface imperfections, things like that, and leave a nice polish on it without too much work. I'm not going to call this edge finished. I'm going to go back over it once it's all together and do a final top coat of it there. And then buff this again and you know hit it with alcohol and things like that. And you remember I mentioned earlier I had a little bit of excess paint on the inside. Just hitting it with a dry cloth took it all right off. Because again, it's not a prepared surface, it's a smooth surface. It isn't scuffed. Paint doesn't want to stick to it, so a little bit of suggestion will make it not. There we go, that was a pretty straightforward way of getting a, a couple layers of paint on that. Our edge is all nice and covered. Certainly passable enough to where we can go ahead and assemble the wallet without worrying too much about how that edge is going to look. Now we have two pieces that are ready to be joined together. I think what I'm going to do, because it's getting on two hours in at this point, I think what we'll do is this. I'm going to go ahead and do one side of it. I'm going to glue this one side here and show you how I do that, and then uh, we'll go from there. We'll, we'll probably call it a day if that's... So I'll get one side glued, holes punched, and stitched. Oh, geez, John, thank you. Very, ki very kind of you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm kind of flabbergasted. I don't know what to say, but thank you. <laughs> so I'll show you here. I'll show you how I attach the back to the front and how I punch the holes through both of them to get a nice clean stitch. And doing half of it is basically the same as doing all of it, for at least for the purposes of the camera. So we'll do that, and I think I'll call it a day. And then, Bob, I think from here, I'm just going to go ahead and finish this for you off camera. Then hopefully, God willing, by the end of the week, it should be on its way to you. Because we actually got, uh, this, this went pretty smoothly. We didn't really have any hiccups. 
If I hadn't talked through half of it, I probably would have been done by now, but I'm glad you decided to hang out and watch. We're going to go ahead and make a couple marks here. I need to know where this piece lines up in here because I need to scuff the interior. So, so I, I, I admire any man who'll spend money to show an emoji, so that's... God bless you. You're a, a, truly a man of the times. <laughs> So nothing complicated there. I'm simply laying the interior on top of the exterior and making some marks. Try to get them on camera there. See if I can make them a little more visible. They're a little difficult to spot, but right there you can see them. Those two marks there I know are where the bottoms of the card slots stop. So I know that all of this section here must be scuffed. I know that this section we leave alone. This section here for the other side, again, we scuff. So we're going to go ahead and do that real quick. I'm just taking my scribe. Going in along the edge. It always pains me to do this to uh, such nice leather, but it, it must be prepared. <laughs> must be done. Oh, Bob, I'm, I'm glad you, uh, number one, I, I appreciate the trust and, you know, commissioning this, and I appreciate the, the good conversation and fellowship, and, and to everybody else, I, I always appreciate the company during these streams. As I always say, I, I do them more for my own benefit than anybody else's, but the fact that other people benefit from it is certainly nice. So I'm glad that people find them, number one, educational, number two, Somehow, I'm told they're entertaining. I don't quite follow that one, but I'll, I'll take a compliment when it's given, so I, I thank you. Again, if you haven't yet, please do take a hot second, hit the like button. That does help me in the algorithm, whatever the hell that means. But I do find that the more of my live streams that have likes on them, the better they are, they are visible to people, and that helps me to grow. I, again, I, I don't ask for any money for doing this. I just do this for free, because all of the... The advice I've received over the years from experienced individuals has always been given to me without condition. There was never anything, you know, I'm teaching you this if you'll do this for me. I'm teaching you this if you'll pay me. Never been that. All the people who know what they're doing never ask a dime for it. So I give this away to everybody else to kind of pass that knowledge forward to others to, to carry on my part of that, I guess. So... I hope that uh, I hope that you find this beneficial to your own crafting. Need to get the clamps out, and I need to scuff the inside of this. Now, this bottom edge down here, which is just raw flesh side, we don't need to scuff that. But this inside edge that is finished, we do. I like that. You know what, I might as well just get the other side too. Even though I'm not ready to glue it yet, might as well get it. Go. Okay. I'm going to take a single needle. Remember earlier when I was demonstrating the alignment of that top stitch line? I poke the needle through the hole to hold it in place and align it. I'm going to do the same here. So I'm going to put a needle through that there. That's our index point. I know that these two holes must line up. So having a needle through there physically forces them to be in alignment all the time. That's how I help ensure that. So we're going to put our glue down on this. And using that needle and our eyes and our fingers, we're going to align these two edges together and clamp them in place for the glue to cure. Again, I'm not being shy about glue here, because this part of the wallet, until it's stitched, will be under stress, so we need to have a very secure bond. And even after it's been, you know, mechanically secured with the thread, we still want a very strong bond on this, because this is what functionally makes the wallet. So it must be secure. 
a bit of glue there. It should last quite a bit. Uh, because it actually is, uh, this is an adhesive-backed foil, so it's applied with heat, about 180 degrees. When it press on there, the glue is melted and then it, it bonds on there. Uh, I have not had any that have worn off yet, uh, and I've had this machine for about three years now. So I know they categorically last at least three years, but should last much, much longer than that. Again, using that needle, we're aligning it up there, and I'm ensuring that the top edges are straight, the corners are straight. Now with my fingertips, and looking again at this bottom edge, pinching the two edges until they're together, and then when I have that lined up, take one of my clamps, clamp it in place there, Work my clamp towards the outside edge. I'm flexing the wallet back and forth to make sure that these two edges are in alignment. They're already very close, again, because as you saw earlier, I did trim them to shape from each other, but still a little bit of play involved with that. Clamp up there near the needle. Now these clamps, People always ask, do they leave marks? And the answer is, on veg tan like this, yes, they do. But I'm clamping it right against the stitch line. So that when I stitch this, any marks that are left over are going to be completely rendered null and void by the fact that there's a stitch going through. Never see them. There, so we're going to let those clamp do the work for us, hold that in place. And it should only take about a minute for this glue to set up. Good. And this other side, we're just going to leave it go. It, it can float freely there. Not a big deal. We'll get to that when we get to it. Eyeballing it, looking at it. All those edges line up. Everything's good there. Now this one will be a good example. I did this... um. I did this example two weeks ago, in which my whole stream basically talked about doing this exact method. But you'll get a little bit of the, the reasoning why I do it this way versus other ways of doing it. So there, there are a couple different schools of thought for doing this. One would be glue the two pieces together and then punch the holes through in one go. Um, that can that works fine, and I did it that way for many years, but you're kind of down to the wire with that. You have very little room for error. Um, you are driving your chisels through an entire you know, eighth inch to three sixteenths inch pieces of multiple layers of leather and hoping that you come through straight on the other side. And with skill and practice, you, know, you can certainly do that, but make it easier for yourself. And that's why I do it this way. I have punched through here through half of the wallets, so I've punched through this. So I've got a good set of clean holes already made on the inside edge. I only have to now punch through the outside edge. This is the only, when I go through and re-punch these, this is the only thickness I'm actually punching through. And I'm doing it through holes that I know are already aligned and straight. So I help mitigate any difference of in difference of, of straightness that may come out on the back side there. The other school of thought is to punch the holes separately. So in other words, punch the interior holes, and then while they're apart, punch the holes on the outside edge. And I'm going to show you why I don't like doing that here in just a second. When I take these clamps off, you'll see that. Um, Victor, do I paint the edge, the edges of the inside hidden pockets as well? Usually I do. In this case, I did not because this is Botero on the inside here. So in this case, rather than having to paint it, I was able to simply burnish it because I wanted it to be the same color. I didn't want it to be a different color than the interior, so I didn't want to paint it brown. And being as I could just burnish it green, I saw no reason to bother painting it. So these interior edges are burnished rather than painted. If this was something like Chev or something that needed to be painted, then yes, I would do that. And in fact, um, this one here, you can see that on the inside edge there, that is painted. This is goat there. This is calf skin. It can't be burnished. So on, the, on this particular case, those edges on the inside edge, those are painted. By now, we can take our, our clamps off. And again, like I was talking about, 
the school of thought that says punch the holes separately while the pieces are apart. I'll show you why I don't like doing that. And you can see that here. So you remember earlier on, even though I lined these two pieces up to each other and trimmed them, you can see right there along the bottom edge, we've got a nice perfectly clean edge. We're perfectly aligned up here, so our, our needle goes straight through there, so we know that that edge is aligned. But despite all of that, I still have a lip visible here, so I'm still somewhat trapezoidal, not perfectly square on this outside versus the inside. Why does that matter? If I had punched these separately, if I had punched holes on the outside before I'd punched the inside, you will recall that when I do that, I'm measuring where the holes go from my outside edge. I take my wing dividers and I mark an edge following that outside line there. Had I done that on this piece here, my holes would be following this line. And we now know that compared to the inside, that line is not true. That line does not line up with where these holes are. So I would have had a difficult choice. I would have either had to trim this edge down and have a much thinner distance, you know, a difference of distance between my stitch to the edge as it gets to the bottom here, so it'd be wider at the top and thinner at the bottom, or I'd have to just leave it as it is and somehow accommodate for that significant gap there, either with edge paint or by gluing in a shim or something like that, none of which is going to be really easy to do or look nice. Whereas with this, all I do now, I trim this to shape, and I'm punching through these holes, so everything is indexed by these holes. So the fact that this is off at the edge means nothing. When I trim this edge shut, or when I, tr when I trim this edge flush, it's only going to be these holes that matter. It'll all be indexed from that. I'll have a nice even distance on the outside as well. And this minor difference in shape versus the outside of the interior is effectively rendered meaningless. So I do a little bit of extra work. It takes a little bit of extra time. But I leave myself that out in the, in the eventuality that maybe I didn't cut it perfectly square. Even though, when I trimmed it, you'll remember, I trimmed it against a perfectly square template, it didn't matter. It came out not perfectly square, because again, we're talking about a material that flexes, a material that is two different layers of different, you know, tensile you know, ability to laminate it together, and they move here and there. They, they behave differently. So this kind of takes into account all of those possible variations that could happen, and it leaves me the ability to work around that and avoid that. So now, with this glue together, I'm going to take my chisels again, and I'm going to go through the holes I've made already. I'm only having to go through a small thickness of leather. I'm not really worried too much about having it be angled one side or another. And I don't have to look terribly closely at what I'm doing because, again, I'm just fitting it into holes that are already punched. Now those ones there down on the bottom, these are stiffer, these are stiffer scales. So these here on the bottom require a heavier punch than these ones do. But even looking at this already, you can see, so look at, you can see my holes coming through the back there. Look at the difference in, in distance from up here versus down here. And it's very hard to tell, but it is there. You can see that uh, by following my holes from the inside, my distance is wider here than it is up there. When I trim that away, it's all going to be the same distance. It's all going to look the same. So even though it takes a little bit of extra time to do, I think it's well worth it. Punch the corner. Now with this flap, Free. I like to continue my stitch across that center. I like the look of having a complete, fully stitched line. Just having that nice, continuous, oval shape of stitches, especially with a contrast stitch like this one, looks very pleasing. So I'm actually going to punch across the bottom there. 
before I do that, I am going to line this up kind of quickly here. I want to. I definitely want to mark where. If I'm to do that, I need to know where on the bottom these stitches are going to line up. And that sounds kind of silly to say. You know, it should be obvious, but it's always good to give yourself as many hints as you can. So it's very hard to tell there, but I can see it here. So looking at that there, I know there that when I do my line across the bottom there. The end has to line up with that hole there. It does. Go there. And now I can carry that stitch through the bottom there, and it lines up perfectly with where the stitches are going to come through from this panel when I attach it. In the course of doing that, we've put a lot of tension and stress on the wallet in different ways. So if you look on the bottom there, we have a little bit of our glue delaminating, not to worry. Again, this is the time to fix all of those things. We just take a little bit of glue, work it into that edge, pull it shut. That will be a-okay. Put my chisels away for now. I think we'll do... I think what I'll do, I'm going to go ahead and stitch this side here, and when I get done with that, I'm going to call it a day because my throat is getting very dry now. So I'm going to say, I'm going to end the poll here. We've had 30 votes, and furnishing just narrowly won out. Looks like a 16 to 14 vote on that, with that poll there. So very, very, very close tie there. Much closer than I thought it was going to be. I would have thought the burnishing would have taken that by a mile. But again, I'm very happy to see that a lot of people... Uh, prefer to edge paint because I, I think it is um I think in terms of appearance I think it is superior but it is certainly not as fun as burnishing but I'm glad to see that so many people uh number one you know put in their input and number two I'm glad to see that it was uh, it was fairly even down the middle so lots of people doing lots of different things always kind of makes me happy to see so we're going to go ahead and measure our thread here I'm going to adjust the camera so you can see the stitching and then like I said this last section of it here I'm going to I'm mostly just going to devote to question and answer. If you have any questions about anything I did here, please do ask. Because when I shut the stream off, that'll be that. I will not be doing any more work on this wallet on stream. I'm just going to go ahead and finish it after this point. So there won't be anything else. Next stream, next Monday stream will be something different than this. I don't know what yet, but uh, if you have any questions about how I'm going to do this wallet, uh, this will be the last time it's on camera. Big old knot here. I do that. One needle threaded. Good. Take the camera here. Clamp that fella in. And again, looking at it here, so this first needle that goes through, uh, because we aligned that with our needle when we glued these together, it comes through and it looks perfect. It's perfectly aligned with the, with the two separate runs of thread there. Uh, recommendations for a hot foil machine. I actually do not know a whole lot about them. I know a bit about mine. Mine is a quick print, which I got for the incredible price of $300. These are normally about $1,500 machines. I got mine used on Craigslist. So if you're able to get one of these machines, they are fantastic. 
but they are admittedly probably more than most people need. These are made to do repeated continuous stamping. Um, and I, that's not at all what I do, so I would say the better bet for most people is if you can find an older like Kingsley machine or some of the newly made foil machines, which I'm not very familiar with, but I hear good things about them. I know there are ones on like Taobao and Amazon that cost 150, 200 bucks. And I hear people saying good things about them, but I have no personal experience with that. So I couldn't say for sure, but I like my quick print. It is more than I need. I would say that if I was going in, if I hadn't found such a good deal on this machine, I would probably have just bought an older Kingsley because they're smaller and they're more, they're built to do more individual stamping. Whereas this machine, again, is meant to do it on basically an industrial scale, but still not a bad thing. So I guess to summarize that, uh, which, which foil machine is the best? Whichever one you can get. Uh, as far as even stitching with alligator, it's about the same as even stitching with anything. Uh, certain alligators are easier to stitch evenly than others. Uh, glazed, I think, is easier to stitch than matte because you get more of a stiff surface that resists the thread and helps it, you know, line up in place. Matte alligator can be difficult to stitch because it's so soft, the thread kind of goes where it wants rather than where you want it to. And that, um, that's a little bit hard to explain until you do it and you'll experience it. So I think between the two of them, glazed is easier. But when it comes down to it, it's about the same as stitching anything else. So it just comes down to get as much practice as you can and really look at what you're doing. When you're still kind of early on and just kind of figuring out your stitch dance, you should be looking at every single stitch. And you'll feel foolish because that will take a lot of time. Um, it will not be quick to do that. But you really do have to inspect every stitch to look at yourself and saying, am I doing it the right way? Am I doing the same thing every time? And with time, with practice, with doing this a lot, you'll eventually come to a point where you don't need to look at every single one. You'll just kind of... It will become such second nature to you that you will simply do it the right way every time. But that doesn't happen overnight. And like I said, that's people are always looking for the magic bullet answer to how do I get clean stitches. It really is taking the time and doing it a lot. Do it as much as you can. And that's a disappointing answer to give because I know people want, people want the trick. People want the secret. But the unfortunate secret is it simply is practice and doing the same thing every single time and recognizing when you come to differences of material when you come to differences of thickness of differences of temper uh, how to adjust the stitch accordingly that is another thing that again it takes practice to figure out what to do when you come to a spot where your stitch just doesn't want to lay even uh, figuring out when to use more and when to use less tension Sometimes when stitching with thinner leathers or softer leathers, less tension is better than more. Because you can definitely pull the stitch out of line. Whereas if you get it to where it's just laying in the right spot, and you're able to leave the tension alone and work down elsewhere, it'll eventually just kind of get to a point where the thread is just going to naturally hold itself in place, even without you pulling it very tight. So you can get away with using less tension to get a cleaner stitch. And as far as when you would want to do that, there is no hard and fast rule for it. You just kind of learn when and where. So again, just practice. But slowing down, I guess, if I had to give you one tip, I'd say slow down and look at what you're doing. Look at how the thread is reacting. Look at how it's behaving when you pull it tight. Is it losing its tension? Is it losing its shape when you pull it tight? Or does it look better before you pull it tight? Look at what it is doing, and it will tell you what you need to do. People tend to want to think about speed as being the sign of being good at stitching, but it's not really it. Speed comes with practice. It's knowing how to respond to different circumstances that signifies somebody who's good at hand stitching. Being able to, to do a switch from soft leather to hard leather, or doing a stitch over a large gap or something like that. Those are things you learn by practice. And again, knowing how and where to do them is what's important.
Uh, people have their own different ways of doing it. I like to stitch, or I, rather, I like to trim first and then stitch. I like to have my pieces to their more or less true dimensions before I stitch, but I know plenty of people who stitch first and then trim to the true dimensions. And I guess what it comes down to is I've had enough experiences with a knife slipping to where I know that sometimes things just plain go wrong. Sometimes it's just not your day. And I kind of, like, like, you know, with this, for example, with having the way I do it here, going to the length of, of punching the holes separately so that I can, you know, make up for errors in cutting like this. Mostly, I've come to a point where I just give myself as many outs as possible, as many ways to anticipate potential problems and address them should they happen. So I kind of look at it as if you're, if you're trimming after you're stitched and something stupid happens and your knife slips or your ruler slips, not only have you wasted all of the time in assembling the leather, you've also wasted all of the time you spent in stitching it. Whereas with this here, not a lot can really go wrong with stitching. Um, stitches, if something goes wrong, you pull them out and you redo them and you lose a lot of time. But if you slip with a knife, you're kind of done. It's kind of over. There are not a lot of ways to rectify that. So I like to get that out of the way first. I like to get any potentially disastrous areas where mistakes could happen out of the way first. So that if, God forbid, I have to redo something, I have then not invested a bunch of time doing all these additional steps afterwards. I guess that's somewhat of a cynical way of looking at it, you know. I I, uh, I just anticipate that here's where things could go wrong, and I leave myself a way to work around it. I do not think that one method is necessarily better than the other. I don't think one is wrong and one is right. There are only right and wrong methods for you. And this is the right one for me. It may not be the right one for you, and that's okay. That's one of the joys of this, is seeing how different people do other things. I know uh, he's usually in here, but he's not this week. Uh, Mr. Thomas Wren of Wren Leatherworks does beautiful, beautiful work. And he is one who stitches and then trims, and I just find that to be crazy. I just can't, I can't get a handle on that. God bless him. I don't know how he does it. I would be, I'd be shaking so much I couldn't do it. But that's how he does it. And he equally finds my way of doing it crazy. So both of us are right. And we both make nice things. And that's all that matters. If you're getting the outcome that you want, if you are making the thing that you want and it looks the way you want it to, then you've done it right. It's like with saddle stitching. I stitch, if you notice, I stitch away from myself. So I tend to stitch backwards from the way everybody else does it. And I think I'm pretty damn good at hand stitching. I think I do a pretty good job of it, even though I do it very differently from how most other people do it. But I still get the same results. I get a nice, even, consistent, slanted stitch on both sides. So therefore, I would say I'm doing it right. This is the way I like to do it, and I get the same results as everybody else. So that makes it A-OK -okay in my book. If I was doing something differently from everybody else and I was getting very clearly different results, you know, unwanted results, then I would have to take a look at what I was doing and say, hmm, this might be wrong. Maybe I should change this. So if you do things differently from me, don't feel bad. Don't worry about it as long as you're getting the results you want. I remember early on when I was still struggling with figuring out how to stitch, how my method of stitch was going to work, I was watching videos from uh, His Eminence, Mr. Nigel Armitage, on his very excellent hand stitching video, and I ended up doing it not at all the way he does it. I do nothing the way he does it. And I was very frustrated early on because I kept getting results differently from what he was getting, and I was getting the right, you know, quote-unquote right results from a different way than he was doing it. I was very frustrated. I was like, am I... Am I crazy? Am I just doing this wrong? And I finally just had to learn to accept it and say, if it's working for me, it must be right. And the rest is history. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking forward to having some lunch when this is all done. Sitting here and working and talking for three hours straight. You work up an appetite. I think I'm going to have me a nice cup of mint tea. I think I'm going to make a sandwich on some fresh baked bread. My wife made a nice loaf of sandwich bread yesterday. I plan to enjoy every piece of it.
So I'm coming down towards the end of this stitch run here. And I'm going to say this is going to be last call for questions. Any questions about anything I've done here, please do ask. And again, if you take a moment, please do hit the like button. And if you haven't yet, please do subscribe. It is much appreciated. It's a good metric for me to know if people are interested in what I'm doing or if I'm just talking into thin air. It helps me to know what you thought. As always, even after the stream ends, if you want to have a question or a conversation with me, feel free to email me. I, I am happy to answer questions, or you can also get me on Instagram. And I try to I try to extend the same courtesy to everybody as was shown to me. I'm happy to answer questions. I believe very firmly that uh, a rising tide lifts all ships. So the more people doing what I do means eventually. There will be more suppliers and more services and more good leathers available or imported into the United States and so on and so forth, as we have seen happen. Put a glue in on this small gap here. There. I'm going to stitch across center gap between the two banks of card slots. And that's going to be my stop point. Let my throat rest a little bit. Talking to the camera voice always makes me more than a little bit tired when I end up finishing. But I do always appreciate the company, and I love the questions you guys ask. It's so nice to be able to see the uh, the chat going off and people asking questions and hopefully learning things. It makes me feel good about what I'm doing here. I always appreciate the company. Just a couple more to go here, and then we're going to call it. So again, last call for questions. And then as far as when this is finished up, Keep an eye on my Instagram. I'll post some pictures of it or probably have to post a reel about it. God, I hate making reels, but that's what's it that's what Instagram wants now. It'll be it. But we got a lot done today. We completely made from scratch, from nothing, the the exterior. We cut, trimmed it, stitched it, painted it. Now we've got it attached at least 50% to the interior. So that's quite a that's quite a good day's work right there. There was no small task getting all of that done. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't pretty damn happy with it. It looks nice. This is a very, very good color combination. Bob, I, I think you're going to like this one, my friend. All right. When doing when doing a cover with lizard and shed lining, do you recommend to use a stiffener between those two? Yes, I always do. Um, and I talked earlier about this one here. The only reason I didn't use a stiffener between the liner and the exterior on this one is because this is Batero. So it's a little thicker and it's naturally a little bit stiffer. Chev, usually when I'm working with it, it's about half a millimeter, so it's very thin. And even when it's thicker, it's quite soft. It doesn't have a lot of resistance. So what I usually do, I fully glue the chev to the to the stiffener. In other words, there's no, um, it's not a floating back or things like that. The chev is glued completely flat, but on a curve to the uh, to the stiffener. And then the stiffener, that assembly is glued on the perimeter to the exterior, and I find that works very well. So that's generally the way I do it. But yes, when using chev, I do recommend using a stiffener to interface that. Um, I'm going to call it here for the day. We'll we'll give one last look at it here. Let me turn the camera down again. Flip it back properly here. So here's where we're at so far. So we've got a good we've got a good start on this. Look at how nice and straight that line is there. Really happy with that. And again, 
here's another another great visible reminder of why I do it this way. You're looking at this edge to this edge, you can see there's a difference here. This one is thicker towards the edge than this one here. But when we trim that away, it's all going to look just like this. And we've got the inside edge stitched across there, so I'm ready to glue this down and stitch this. If you want to learn more about how I do this method here, uh, two weeks ago I did a stream, I think it's got a red wallet on the cover, where I did exactly this, and that was all I did. I did the whole thing. So feel free to go back and check that one. Otherwise, feel free to you know hit me up with any questions you've got. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real pleasure. I, uh, I love doing this, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you guys enjoy it too. So thank you so much. I hope you have a good rest of your day. For those of you in the uh, heat wave areas, I hope you get some cool air soon. Uh, take it easy, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon.